Are you a hearer, but not a doer? Do you live a life as if God is an option and not the center of everything? Now you may be thinking to yourself, it's Saturday morning, you've gotten up early, it's a day of rest, and you've come here to hear a bunch of amateurs preach. Of course I'm a doer. And yes, you attend church faithfully every Sunday. Of course you live the right way. You're reformed, Bible-believing, and you are doctrinally sound. You are the believer of believers. But the truth is, I struggle with this question. Do I truly honor God with my actions? If the answer is no, or not as much as I should, then this sermon should, might be very uncomfortable for you. Once again, are you a hearer, but not a doer? Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, oh wait, oh wait. Therefore, whoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him, him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, oh, I'm sorry, on a rock, yeah. Da, 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 da. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon a sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. Almighty God and great Savior, help me, O oh Lord, today to preach your word. Open the ears, O oh Lord, of everyone here so they may hear your word. Help me, O oh Lord, where I fail, O oh Lord, to take that out of their minds, O oh Lord, and just fill them with the truth that comes from you, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to be changed today, to have our hearts open to you, O oh Lord, to have our walk strengthened, O oh Lord, in you. Help us, O oh Lord, to to know you more and to be better with you, O oh Lord. Help us today, O oh Lord, and always, Lord, as you have done since the day we were born, Lord. Help us, Father, to be more godly men. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, is found at the end of the most lengthy sermon in the Bible. This was delivered by Jesus Christ himself, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus, after performing miracle after miracle after miracle in Galilee, sees the people gathering, and he decides to ascend to a mountain. And in verse 2, the Bible says, Jesus was teaching his disciples, not the people, not the masses, but those who profess to know him and want to follow him. Let's be clear. Anyone can read this and get something from it. Even the most rabid atheists can see the truth in this parable. But these verses are primarily aimed at the followers of God. It is a message for them, for us. The truth of it is spiritually discerned. To me, the Sermon on the Mount is a lengthy warning. It is the guide to what true Christianity is and isn't. Now, the Sermon on the Mount begins with a picture of who can enter the kingdom. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It then progresses through all the temptations and trials that separates one from that walk, from that life, from becoming a true follower of God. And it culminates in today's text, describing the two foundations, the two outcomes, the wise man and the foolish man. Just before that, just before this, Jesus talks about those who use the narrow gate versus the wide gate, or, the na or, or, or who are on the Narrow road versus those who are on the wide road. That's in verse 13 through 14. It talks about the false prophet versus the true prophet, verses 15 through 20. And it concludes in verse 21 to 23, where we learn that not everyone, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. But today's sermon will focus primarily on one point, the obedient hearer versus the disobedient hearer. That's the obedient hearer 
versus the disobedient hearer. Now, there's a distinction between hearing the word of God and accepting that it is true and hearing the word of God and having a changed life because of it. But before we jump in, I want to define some terms in this parable. Now, the house represents the soul or the man, right? His, who he is. It's you, the life you choose to live, whether narrow and in line with God or wide and in line with the world. The rock represents Christ or the gospel. The rain, the floods, the winds, they represent all the things of life that are drawn away from, that draw us away from the narrow gate, that keeps us from the narrow path that leads to the eternity with Christ, right? So we have the house, which represents you. We have the rock, which represents Christ or the gospel. And then we have the rain, the floods, and the winds, which represents all the things that happen to us in this life. But now let's get to the meat of it. So once again, the wise man, or the obedient hearer, builds his house, his soul, or life, upon a rock, which is Christ. Now, this is quickly underscored in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4, where it says, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So, so this imagery it was used throughout the Bible. There's the chief cornerstone, right? I'm built, upon this rock will I build my church. Right? And we have to use scripture to interpret scripture. So it's clearly talking about Christ here. It's clearly talking about God and, and the kingdom. Now, the foolish man, or the disobedient here, builds his house, his soul, his life, upon sand, which I would say is himself or self. Right? It's his desires, his wants, his sin. Think of the rich man who heaped up his wealth and he put it into a bigger barn. And Jesus said in scriptures, this very night, your soul is required of you. We can't take it with us. And like Mike is going to mention in his sermon coming up, many people's life goals is riches. is wealth, is accumulation, relationships, what, things that are passable and will go away. This is a picture of a man's changeable and finite nature. And one of the things that, I, that, that brought me to Christ was this realization that I don't really know what I want. I don't know what I need. I, my decisions lead me on these, these difficult paths, which I'm sure many of you look back now 10 years, 15 years, five years ago, three years ago, and you say, why was I doing that? Right? We can't depend on ourselves to, to know what's right, what the, the right path is. And then the rain, the floods, and the winds, they beat on that house. Now, I want you to realize that both the obedient here and the disobedient here, they face the same things. Same situation affects both, right? Jesus is not saying there's going to be a different circumstance for those who listen to him, who follow him, who are in him. We're all facing the same things. And which one of us has not been caught outside in the rain? without an umbrella, got soaked. Or watched on TV as houses have been submerged under underwater after a flood. Or hasn't seen hurricane-forced winds blow everything away in a place like Haiti. Now, these forces of nature attack us daily. But I think Jesus is referring to the spiritual winds and the spiritual floods, and the difficulty things of life that beat upon us, right? Deaths, poverty, uh, depression, all these different things that are coming at us. It's drawing us away from the path that God has set for us. Now, I think to understand this parable, it's probably wise to compare and contrast a similar parable. And this is the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. Now, a quick synopsis of this parable for those who may not know it is that the sower, think of a farmer planting crops, right? A sower who throws out his seeds, it falls on different types of soils, right? The wayside, the rocky areas, and thorns. And Jesus explains it this way. Um, And actually, this is the one time Jesus does explain the parables. He does go into details to what each thing means. 
right? And so if you want to understand how to, a parable, I would read this parable where he actually explains it. Because one of the reasons that Jesus spoke in parables is that he, everyone was not expected to understand it. Right? So the wayside represented the wicked one, the devil, Satan, who comes and he quickly takes the gospel from you. You hear it, sounds really good. You think, oh, this is, I, I, like, I like church. I like, and then he just takes it out of you, and the next week you're back in the club. All right? The rocky areas represent those who hear the word, and they're happy, they're, they, they're joyous about it. But then tribulation of this life, such as persecution, difficulties, they cause them to be offended, and they're not able to endure, right? Women can't be preachers. Men have to be the head of the households. You can't have sex out of marriage. Homosexuality is bad. All these different things, it, it, just, it, doesn't, it rubs them the wrong way, right? And so they kind of they step away from the faith. And then there are the seeds that fall amongst the thorns. And Jesus says that they represent the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches that take us away from the word. I don't have to explain these things to you. You guys face it every day. Right? We all deal with it. Now, these are the three responses that unbelievers have to the gospel. And I believe the winds and floods and rains are just another representation of the different ways that people are drawn away from God. Now, the main difference between the sower parable and this parable is that Jesus is, scare, is teaching a scary but real scenario where a false believer fools himself into thinking that they are in the faith. Right? And that parable is just showing you they heard the word, stepped away, they're not going to church. Uh, we can see that their life is, a, is kind of a mess. We can see that they've just rejected Christ. But then there are those who are coming to church, coming to a men's breakfast. They go to, go, they go to everything. But inside of themselves, they're, they're, there's this, this voice telling me, I don't know if I really believe in this. This is scary, right? <laughs> it's a scary thought that on the day of judgment, God's going to say to that deluded person, depart from me, ye workers of lawlessness, of iniquity. This is the disobedient hearer who spends his life deluding himself. He's attending church, singing songs, right? He's evangelizing. He's even preaching. But he's never truly bent his knee to Christ. He's never, he's, never, he's never looked at himself and seen himself as a sinner with a dark, searing heart. He's never seen himself that way. He's a good guy. You know, he just, want, he just needs a little structure in his life. This person has built his house on the sand. The shifting sands of self-will. Now, the obedient here, he's the one who endures to the end. He endures. Once again, he's not living in a special, unique life. He just, okay, homosexuality's wrong. Okay, I got to do what God said. You know what? I'm not sure if I really like my wife today, but God says I have to love my wife, sacrificially. You know, I, don't re I, I can't stand my boss, but God says to, to work under him as if he is Christ himself. All right, got to do it. Right? They endure. The wise or the obedient here is what Jesus describes as the blessed. Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. Why? Because they shall enter the kingdom. They shall inherit the earth. They shall be filled. They are the ones that, that, God, that, that bring forth good fruit. That's in verse 17 of chapter 7, right? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Do you bring forth good fruit? Are people growing in faith because of your ministry? Are you a light to others? Do you study to show yourself approved? Are you always ready to give an answer to the hope you have in Christ? Now, today, many televangelists and prosperity teachers paint a picture of, Christ of a Christian life that is easy, full of wealth and free from sickness and, 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 and disease. A Christian life that is surrounded by a protective, protected bubble of faith. Right? 
a Christian walk that is devoid of any real truth. But the reality is that all those who are in Christ Jesus will face persecution, difficulties, and the frailties of life. We're going to get old, just like everybody else. We're going to have deaths, just like everybody else. We're going to, we're going to have days where we're angry, like everybody else. Right? The principles and proverbs that we're living by are going to fail us sometimes. Right? And not all of those who profess Christ will endure to the end because they were never of us. That's, that's a trick, right? It's not, it's, 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 it's the, 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 the point, this is the point that Christ is making here about those who can enter, those who wish to enter. A, but what does it say? Many are called, right? Many are called, right? The broad way. A lot of people like Christianity. A lot of people profess to be Christians. But, but they are they. Now, this is what the parable is getting to the heart of, that the Christian walk is not easy in the sense that God doesn't take away every obstacle, right? We're not saved fully formed and perfect, right? That's why the Christian walk is described as a walk. It's a marathon, not a sprint, meaning this is not something you can judge three weeks after conversion, right? How many of us have known brothers or known people who are they just, the delight was shown to them, and they were excited, and they were passionate, and they wanted to go to everything, and then two months later, can't find them. I don't like the church. Not enough women in the church. Ah, uh, the pastor's talking too much about sin. You know, my job, you know, I got to work some long hours at my job. It, it doesn't stay with them. Right? Why? Because it's a lifetime of ups and downs. Right? It's growth that's demonstrated through endurance. Right? Ten years later, I'm still struggling. I'm still trying. I'm still attending. I still have days when I don't want to get up. I don't want to go out. This is how we get passages like 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, where Paul says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. I think this is the same Demas who in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24, that Paul calls a fellow laborer, right? Not a guy, not somebody, a fellow laborer. Like, Paul considered him right hand, left hand, right? I can leave him here and run this area because he's faithful. Isn't that scary? I'm terrified of reading that. I'm scared of hearing that. Are you a Demas? Are you a Demas? Do you ask yourself stuff like that? Do you, do you wonder about things like that? N now, I'm not saying that, so that our salvation is some kind of precarious situation where you're like on a needle's edge and maybe I'm saved, maybe I'm not saved. I, I, I'm not saying that's what the life is like. But I do believe in James when he says, faith without works is dead. Show me faith without works. And I will show you my faith with works. That's what I'm talking about. This is not me saying this. This is the point of this parable. We are known by our fruits. Now, this may be beyond me to properly explain, but what I'm trying to say is that the human heart is, is deceitful. It's wicked. We could be fooling ourselves. We could really... Believe, really not believe the truth of the gospel, right? It could be his head knowledge. Oh, yeah, it makes sense that a man should be the head of the household. Yeah, church attendance sounds good. I mean, hey, it's Sunday. I'm not really doing anything else, right? I love the songs. I love the hymns. It makes me feel good, right? You know, yeah, there's some sinners out there. There's a, I, I, that guy was cheating on his wife. I don't do that. That's right. We need to talk about that guy. We could just be playing along, though, right? Right? You could know in your heart of hearts that the Holy Spirit's not in you. Right? You could be a chameleon, just, you know, they got the language, you got the mannerisms, you, you know, the amens, right? God willing, Jesus' name, you know we, know, we know all the phrases, right? We know all the scriptures, we know what to say, but 
what happens when you're home by yourself? Right? What happens when you're in another town, another city? I went to Florida the other day, and it was like, I was so confused. Like, there was no one to tell me. No one's going to find out what I did, right? How am I going to act in a situation where no one, there's no elders, there's no one going to, those are the kind of things that kind of reveals where you are. Now, I'm not saying this to, to kind of put people in one camp and some people in the other camp. I'm saying this because it's not too late. If you're not sure, if you truly think that you're faking or mimicking, or you're truly not in the kingdom, the Bible says that Jesus will not turn away anyone who truly seeks him. It doesn't, 15 years of faking, it doesn't matter. He won't. Today, today, if you do it, he will not say, ah, not this time. So the Sermon on the Mount began by saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Simple question, right? Is it a simple answer? Are you building your house, your life, the way you live, the the day-to-day circumstances on a sandy beach full of feelings and your own self-will? Are you a disobedient hearer? Are you building sandcastles, right, that will wash away on the day of judgment? Or are you building your house on the rock of Christ, on the true cornerstone? So in conclusion, Jesus is not making a case here that not all, not all, not all who say, I'm sorry, Jesus has made a case here that not all, not all, not all who say Lord, Lord, or claim to be believers will be found to be faithful on judgment day. How can we know? How can we have eternal security? I believe it is answered by what foundation we build our life and our walk upon. Is it Christ? Is it the gospel? And I I didn't talk about it, but I I keep saying we and and what we're going to do. And I don't want you guys to think it's just mustering up something. I'm just saying you have to bow to him. you got to recognize that you're a sinner. you got to realize what your real situation is, right? And I think a lot of us, even us who are believers, straight believers, we kind of have a lot of will there still, right? I have a pastor Peter, pastor... uh, Pastor Peter, Pastor Phil, Dan, different men tell me stuff. And I'm like, ah, I don't do it that way. It's not, that's not my style. Right? Men who godly who live the life and they're, they're telling me to do it a different way. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to try it this way for a while. You know, I think, I think I know better. So is it built on Christ? Is it built on the gospel? Will you ask yourself, seriously? Will you pray about this? Will you examine yourself to see if you're in the faith? Will you, will you go to somebody like a Pastor Peter and a Pastor Phil, someone mature? And will you say, I, I, I'm not sure where I am. I, I, I want to be firmly in Christ's bosom. I, I want to be there. But I, I don't think I am right now. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. I don't want you to be a disobedient hearer. Now, for those of you who are firmly in the faith, right, this sermon, yeah, yeah, I got what you're saying. Glenn. I'm, 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 I don't worry about that. I love God so much. But are you struggling? Do you have some days when you're, you're not doing that? I'm just, just saying, just wondering. You know, I, I have them. You know, do, do you realize that it's normal, that this life is precarious? Is, is what you're feeling inside for God, is that manifesting out? Is that, is that reflecting at, ch- at, at work? Is that reflecting with your, your relationships with your wives, your children, with your friends? Right? Would, would they say, I'm seeing Christ in you? Well, this, this, this sermon's for you too. This parable's for you too. I want you to identify the one thing that's barring you from walking triumphantly in the light of Christ. Isolate that. Work on that. 
ask God to, to move you in the right direction. Because what, what did I say? We're not fully formed. And there's no one here who's got it covered, who's got it, you know, under wraps, right? And, and we have to endure to the end. I don't want you guys to be Demas. I don't want you guys to, 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 to go before the Lord and, and, and say, I've done all these great things in your name. And he says, I, I, I never knew you. You built your house on the sand. Let's pray. Almighty Father, our great God, O oh Lord, help us, O oh Lord. Help us to, to walk in the path that you've laid out for us. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to be men of faith, to endure, O oh Lord, through tribulations and trials and difficulties, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Help us, O oh Lord, to know your son and to know the darkness of our hearts. Lord, I, I pray no one here is a disobedient hearer. I pray that no one here thinks they're there, but they're just not there, O oh Lord. Let us examine ourselves. Help us, O oh Lord, to, to walk in the path you've laid for us, O oh Lord. Be with us today, O oh Lord, and all days. Let us all, every man here, let us all be there together on that joyous day when your son returns. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.